Um, we know invasive lionfish can degrade the systems that they've invaded, but people in newly invaded areas are uncertain how to respond. In the Western Atlantic, where lionfish have been present since the mid-1980s, there have been a number of programs and technologies that have proven successful, but there are also some responses that were not so successful, in some cases backfired. Uh, hopefully these notes will help guide efforts in the Mediterranean and help avoid mistakes made in the Western Atlantic. Uh, Dr. Giddings, Dr. Harris, and I will first touch on some of the practices that have been successful in the Western Atlantic. Go ahead, Steve, for the next slide. So first, let's talk about what's worked, specifically removals. Uh, organized lionfish removal activities are events that have demonstrated that they can be extremely effective and are probably the most effective means of removing large quantities of lionfish very quickly. Um, while I'll be going a little bit more into detail uh, in tomorrow's presentation, um, it's important to mention them here as a success story. Shortly after lionfish started showing up on reefs in the Western Atlantic, organizations such as the Reef Environmental Education Foundation began hosting lionfish removal events. Um, these removal events, also known as derbies, reward competitors or scuba divers that remove the most, the smallest, and the largest lionfish. As time passed, the number of events increased in the local communities as well as governments began providing support for these events. Um, in Florida or in the United States, the state government provides financial and logistical support to groups interested in hosting lionfish removal events. And numerous state governments have actually hosted season long or warm season uh, removal events, which incentivize individuals to collect the lionfish on their own time. Um, these have been very successful as from 2014 to 2020, the state of Florida alone, um, more than 758,000 lionfish have been removed as a result of their removal programs. Uh, these events have a number of benefits. Not only do you physically remove lionfish from the reef, which benefits the system, but the scientific community is able to access a large number of samples to collect valuable information about their biology and distribution. Um, further, lionfish are collected and can be prepared at local restaurants or distributed to the market to develop a market demand, which Dr. Harris will be discussing in the next slides. Um, the event itself also acts as a focal point for outreach and education, which Dr. Giddings will talk about later in this presentation as well. So we'll go ahead and move on and I'll hand it on over to Holden Harris. Thank you, Alex. So for lionfish market, it helps the lionfish are, of course, really, really tasty. And this commercial lionfish fishery could offer a win-win-win solution. So first, as an alternative harvestable stock for fishers, and second, as a protein source to improve food security for coastal communities, and third, as a means to remove lionfish and mitigate their ecological impacts. The most common means of harvesting lionfish is from spearfishing using scuba. In Florida, areas that have high concentrations of lionfish have enabled the development of a commercial spearfishing fishery with yields as high as 20,000 kilograms per year. Although lionfish food fisheries have been widely promoted, they still face market challenges. There is initial concerns that lionfish may contain high levels of mercury or ciguateratoxins. Research has now confirmed that lionfish meat is relatively low in mercury levels. And although lionfish can accumulate ciguatoxins, it's only in the equatorial regions where these toxins are prevalent, and these levels are no higher than other piscivore species about the same size as lionfish. The most prevalent misconception for eating lionfish is that people often misinterpret lionfish, which has venomous spines, that they could also have venom poisonous meat. Outreach campaigns have really worked to clarify that the venom in lionfish spines do not affect their meat. And in fact, the allure of eating a venomous predator that's invasive can be used to help increase their economic value. And really, for a commercial market, the economic value of lionfish is key. In Florida and many other areas of the Caribbean, lionfish is now in high demand by seafood consumers. In fact, it's now generally true that demand surpasses supply. Restaurants and wholesalers basically want lionfish, but oftentimes they can't find them. The primary impediment to the commercial market is the supply chain breakdown at the producer level. 
basically, we need more fishers and economic incentives to harvest lionfish. The ex-vessel price of lionfish, that is, what fishermen get off the boat, is now about two and a half U.S. dollars per kilogram. And this is slightly higher or about the same as other high-end reef fishes, such as snappers. And outreach campaigns have really helped to increase this economic value. Recently, though, we've witnessed the emergence of a novel ulcerative skin disease in lionfish, as Alex Fogg alluded to earlier this morning. Densities in some of these high concentrated reefs declined by 60 to 80 percent. And these density declines caused region-wide catch per unit effort for fishermen to decrease by about 50 percent due to spearfishing becoming less economical. We don't go into too much details, but we detail uh, these population declines in an article published earlier this year in Nature Scientific Reports, and I'll post that link in the chat after this. This also points to the inherent paradox of developing a free market approach to an invasive species. Basically, if we're successful at reducing densities of lionfish, the catch per unit effort for fishermen will make commercial harvests less commercially feasible. It's not to say that a commercial market isn't impossible, but this paradox should be considered by policy and management strategies. And we currently have bioeconomic forecasting projection research in review right now. And I'll share with the group uh, when that comes out. And with this paradox in mind, I'll turn it over to Dr. Giddings to discuss the gear and outreach campaigns to, to encourage lionfish harvest. Thanks, Holden. Um, so in addition to being a, a gigantic threat to the Caribbean and Western Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico uh, reef systems, uh, there have been a lot of opportunities realized by a number of entrepreneurs and retailers uh, related to the lionfish invasion. <clears throat> a number of people have in, uh, invented or developed or started selling specialized equipment for, for hunting and handling lionfish. Um, and it really, there are four categories, spears and spear tips, containers to hold lionfish, the gloves that are used by divers and handlers, and uh, more recently traps uh, being modified or developed and invented to catch lionfish in places where we can't spear them. Um, so with regard to spears and spear tips, uh, in many places, as we've heard before, there are restrictions on <clears throat> the length or the types of spears that are allowed to be used. Um, but fortunately, Lionfish, as, whole, as uh, Alex said, are so easy to kill because they're docile and they don't move much. Uh, you can use just about any kind of spear to, to kill a lionfish. So even with the restrictions, uh, it's quite easy to collect lionfish. Um, the zookeeper is in this picture was invented by Ali al Haj uh, back in 2011. Ali had been in a completely different line of work prior to um, the lionfish problem. And with the invention of Zookeeper, started a whole new business selling equipment to help divers handle lionfish underwater and store them uh, safely so that the fish don't escape and they don't uh, spine the uh, or uh, uh, poke the diver. So the Zookeeper uh, containment device is, is good for that because you can take a spear, push a lionfish through a retainer, pull the spear out and the lionfish will stay in the container. This picture is a large zookeeper. They make smaller ones. And Ali also now has kits that he can sell in small packages where you can build your own zookeeper with the parts from his kit. Um, and the, the gloves that this diver is wearing are either puncture resistant or puncture proof. Um, in the early days of the lionfish invasion, even commercial divers were starting to get uh, spined by lionfish and that would make them lose days of work and have to stop actual jobs on high cost um, facilities like oil platforms so the international association of diving contractors consulted with experts in the lionfish world to find gloves that their divers could use that would protect them from lionfish spines and um, lionfish divers had already looked into this because they realized the threat posed by lionfish uh, spines. And most, if, if divers don't use uh, puncture proof gloves, it's usually because it limits their dexterity and they choose uh, gloves with more dexterity that may allow a, a 
a spine to penetrate the glove, but it will um, it will wipe off some of the venom as it's doing so. So if they are uh, poked by a lionfish, it doesn't um, inject the venom quite as much. So there are different uh, gloves being used. And I will talk more about traps tomorrow, uh, but just to give you a teaser, uh, there are traps being developed, some of which are pre-existing types of lobster traps or fish traps who, that are being modified to allow more capture of lionfish in deep water where divers cannot go. Um, and there are some that are even electronic that only open with lionfish in the vicinity. So they, but they're electronic and they're risky in that regard because the electronics and salt water oftentimes conflict. And then I've been working on a mechanical trap that is based on a, a fish attraction device and it's baitless. So that's the one we'll be talking about with, uh, with Holden tomorrow that reduces bycatch and um, bottom impact and ghost fishing by the fact that it's a non-containment trap. It lays open on the bottom and just attracts lionfish to a structure rather than containing this fish uh, in the trap itself. <clears throat> The challenges to some of this equipment um, are that there are existing regulations that you have to get past, and that's a very important step in the dealing with lionfish in any country that you're, you're trying to work on, um, and issuing permits to people so that they can work and they can control lionfish while they may not be able to do other things like hunt other species with the spears that they're allowed to use for lionfish. And then the third problem here is that the lionfish world is really a small market. So regardless of what you're selling or promoting, there aren't that many people to, to buy your product, but uh, it's still made money for a number of people. It hasn't made anybody rich yet, but um, it's, it's making money for people. And now moving on to yet another um, aspect of what has worked with this invasion, the outreach activities associated with lionfish have been very, very, uh, important and productive and successful. Um, they've increased awareness and in the empowerment of people to help deal with this problem. You see lionfish mentioned in lectures and discussion panels, on uh, websites and web um, news stories, magazine articles uh, all over the place, um, YouTube videos, documentaries, etc. cetera. Uh, and as we've discussed already, they're prominent now in artwork and in jewelry, um, uh, T-shirts everywhere. Lionfish are very popular in the Caribbean region because of their increasing awareness due to outreach events. Um, you can even find them in informal and formal uh, lectures and uh, uh, curricula for schools and for other uh, uh, educational institutions. Uh, Alex mentioned the Reef Environmental Education once, and that's a nonprofit group in the Florida Keys that was instrumental and has been ever since the start of the invasion in promoting awareness and education and control. They host the derbies regularly to get rid of lionfish um, and handling workshops and jewelry making workshops, uh, fish preparation workshops, etc. Uh, you'll hear the name Lad Akins a lot. He was a early and often promoter of activities surrounding lionfish and deserves a lot of credit for all the everything we know about lionfish. There are also a number of scientists whose name you'll hear a lot. James Morris, uh, Mark Hickson, Mark Albin, Stephanie Green. These were very important people in the early days of the invasion to help us understand it. And lately, and not lately, for years now, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission has been very active as at the state level in the United States to promote lionfish uh, hunting and uh, recording data, et cetera. You can learn a lot by looking at the FWC website. Um, and uh, there's a growing social awareness through the social networking that Stacy and Jim talked about, Lionfish University being one of the prominent aspects of that prominent players in that uh, regard. Uh, you can find info information on, on Lionfish University's Facebook and their website on how to prepare and how to for a lionfish hunt, how to do a lionfish hunt how to process fish, how to treat stings, etc. A lot of information uh, is available through this social network. They raise money, they promote the use and the consumption of lionfish. It's a good way to meet people and get advice on equipment or places to go, events that are happening, and hotspots, as Scott was talking about. 
Um, and through all this networking, et cetera, and the outreach, plans have been developed in the, in the U.S. nationally for lionfish response. Uh, at the level of the program that I work for in NOAA called the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, we have a plan for the response to lionfish in sanctuaries. The National Park Service has a plan. There are, there's a wider Caribbean response plan. And then individual countries like Belize and St. Eustatius, St. Lucia, um, Anguilla have their own plans for responding to lionfish within their country. And our group that's on the phone today is also working right now with Antigua on developing response, a derby and other response actions in that country. Okay, um, I think we're gonna go back to uh, Alex or Holden to talk a little bit more about regulations. Uh, that's me now. And as Steve mentioned, this work to improve the technological gear and to improve awareness about lionfish has really been successful to increase lionfish harvest. However, we've learned from the Western Atlantic invasion that current fisheries regulations can often impede the lionfish response. Marine managers have responded to this by developing policy changes that can encourage lionfish removals. These regulatory changes generally have one of three purposes or categories. First, to allow widespread harvest of lionfish. Second, to allow lionfish to be commercially sold. And third, to allow lionfish and only lionfish to be harvested in areas where spearfishing is otherwise prohibited. In Florida, where fisheries are very highly regulated, lionfish has been purposely deregulated. So now, unlike all other saltwater species, people that are harvesting lionfish do not need a fishing license and there are no limits on the number of lionfish that can be harvested. Restrictions on spearfishing using rebreathers have also been lifted. And specific attention has been given in Florida to developing the commercial side for lionfish. Regulations have been put in place to allow lionfish sales to be done by fishermen to licensed wholesalers with only the basic commercial licenses. In many areas, regulations have sought to allow lionfish harvest in places where spare fishing would otherwise be prohibited. So generally, these are marine protected areas such as the Florida Keys uh, or the Flower Gardens National Marine Sanctuary in the United States, or in Bonaire, the Cayman Islands, where spare fishing is normally completely uh, unallowed. To address the lionfish problem specifically, new accommodations allow divers to hunt with spears if they have appropriate training and use specific gear restrictions. In some cases, blanket permits have been issued to trusted organizations like dive operators, or marine institutes, research areas, or research organizations. And these allow trained divers and those organizations to hunt lionfish. For example, permits are held by the Reef Environmental Education Foundation, as Steve mentioned, in the Florida Keys, and by the Central Caribbean Marine Institute in Little Cayman. And as Dr. Ullman pointed out earlier this morning, the risk and damages of not removing lionfish appears to really far outweigh the potential that people have to potentially abuse these regulations. And really what we've seen so far is that these government stakeholder partnerships has shown that divers and their organizations can be trusted to remove lionfish. Lastly, guidelines are currently being developed for the potential use of the new traps that Steve mentioned earlier. Uh, environmental assessments have recently been completed by the National Marine Fisheries Service that allows uh, testing and eventual inclusion of these certain trap designs in the commercial use, where otherwise uh, fishing traps are not allowed in the United States. And Steve and I will talk uh, much more specifically about these traps tomorrow. I'll turn it back over to Alex now. All right, so we'll go ahead and wrap it up here. So moving into some things that were maybe not successful in controlling lionfish in the Western Atlantic or failed. This is a photo um, that exemplifies something that you should not do and resulted in a, a pretty painful stick. Um, early in the Western Atlantic lionfish evasion, there were groups and individuals that thought that if you throw enough money at the problem, it would go away. This mode of thinking was the beginning of bounties or rewarding divers for specific financial incentives to harvest lionfish. Um, the few bounties that were implemented were soon after canceled due to funding sources being depleted. Uh, I was actually one of the individuals who created a bounty, but it was the, the it was to collect more samples for my research. 
Uh, unfortunately, the funds I set aside were gone in a matter of a couple weeks, and I had to figure out another way to acquire uh, more lionfish for my research. Uh, similarly, in the Caribbean, numerous countries have developed bounty programs, and again, the money was quickly depleted, and the lionfish invasion really raged on. Um, we've already discussed numerous alternative programs that have worked. Instead of a bounty, maybe use those funds to host a lionfish removal event or a derby. The number of lionfish removed will be much higher, and the money can be uh, leveraged for a friendly and incentivized competition. Um, another failed experiment was trying to encourage native uh, predators to develop a taste for lionfish by actually feeding those native species. There have been numerous examples of individuals throughout the Western Atlantic attempting this. Unfortunately, in many cases, the native predators didn't begin preying on lionfish and just associated divers with food. It became a dangerous situation, um, and in many cases, lionfish hunting and in some cases, diving had to be suspended in those areas. Gentlemen, can you wrap up your speech, please? Yep, next slide is the last one. Excellent. Go ahead, Steve. <laughs> all right, we'll go into much more detail about these topics. If you want to talk offline, here's all of our contact information. Please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you.